Greg. Hey, Polly, how you doing? Good. How are you? I'm all right. Excited about today. Yeah. Who, we, who have we got? We have an alumni. <laughs> That's right. I say it. we've only had one alumni before, but now we have two. All right. Who? So joining us today, our very own executive director, Rebecca Elwell. You better be on our best behavior. We do. I don't think it's possible that we can be on our best behavior. <laughs> we could definitely, definitely try. Our paychecks might depend on it. Exactly. Yes. So we'll be nice. We won't do any hard hitting questions. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what what's she talking about? Well, today we're gonna to be talking about the new initiative Safe Homes. Mom. So um I know we revamped it. It went from you know one strategy to a more community-based mm -hmm. strategy. So it should be good to hear about it and uh how we can get involved in what actually safe home is. Ooh. For me, you know, it's locking your doors. Yeah. And uh yeah. You know, a little sign outside, home protected, maybe a ring camera. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it's that. No, we'll I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, joining us today on the Totally Preventable Podcast for round two, we have Totally Preventable alumni, Executive Director <laughs> Rebecca Elwell of the Strategic Prevention Partnerships. Rebecca, how are you? I'm doing great, Greg. You got that perfectly. That's a mouthful. It was. Um, strategic strategic prevention partnerships just on its own is a mouthful. Um, but uh, just so that your audience knows, strategic prevention partnerships is made up of two um, sort of side-by-side -side initiatives for Newport County. One is the Newport County Prevention Coalition, which primarily uh, addresses youth substance misuse or substance use, alcohol, marijuana, vaping. Um, and for older adult for for adults and older adults um, also looks at the opiate issues in our community. And then the second portion of strategic prevention partnerships is our no wrong door initiative, which addresses um, the barriers that folks experience in getting um, care for mental health or um, substance use disorders. And we really focus on um, helping folks have access to treatment and recovery, but also focus on promoting the steps toward positive mental health. All right. Yeah, thanks for that. That's very clear. So while we could have you talk about all sorts of things today, um, we would like to hear about the Safe Homes Initiative. Sure. That's, that's uh, one of our very exciting... Um, programs that we have that addresses underage drinking. So oftentimes when we talk about ways to minimize underage drinking, we often talk about or hear about peer pressure, or we hear about um, youth going into a bar, a restaurant, a liquor store, and getting um, access to alcohol. Um, those sort of bars, liquor stores, those are retail access points for underage drinking. Um, and Safe Homes really hones in on the social access to alcohol, which means that a young person gets alcohol through um, social means, a family member, a friend, um, you know, someone that they're directly uh, connected to. So it's not coming through purchasing it in an out, you know, in an outside space. It's it's procured by getting it from someone they know. Um, one of the data points that we work off of is the fact that the younger the child in their substance use or in their alcohol use, the more likely it is that that kid got it from their parent, whether the parent knows it or not, or they get it from the parent of a friend. And that's the point of safe homes. It's to address that social access to alcohol, whether a kid be in their own house and getting alcohol from their parents' unlocked liquor cabinet, or they're going to a friend's house and getting from that parent's unlocked alcohol storage space. So just to clarify for our listeners, is safe homes, are we saying, is the program saying for adults not to drink? Absolutely not. We are addressing underage drinking. 
So it's anybody, of course, under the age of 21 in the United States. Um, over 21 is the legal age of alcohol consumption and purchase. Um, under 21 is the uh, demographic that we're really thinking about. And we're thinking about kids as young as middle school because we are um, in having increasing knowledge of the fact that kids are accessing alcohol and using alcohol um, at very young ages. Um, fifth grade and up, we ought to be having very frequent conversations with our young people. But sometimes we hear about things like safe homes, like an alcohol and drug-free environment. And that um, can be misleading, I think, to parents sometimes. We're not talking about parents not having alcohol or storing alcohol in the home. We're talking about parents taking um, active steps to make sure that that alcohol does not get into the hands of their children. Thank you for clarifying. And so for people that may not know, um, can you tell us why our young people shouldn't be drinking? That's a whole segment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, underage alcohol use is totally preventable. We can keep alcohol out of the hands of kids. Um, it is very interesting to see some of the brain scans um, that are accessible these days. I mean, years ago, we used to say, well, it's illegal, it's this, it's that. We have medical documentation of the effects on alcohol on the developing adolescent brain. We want to make sure that we as adults are doing everything that we can to make sure that the, the brains of our adolescent youth are not damaged um, it, by any additional chemicals or substances that they may partake in that will have a long-term effect on their learning, on brain development, on their impulse control, um, and all of those things are affected by alcohol, not just uh, while they are under the influence of alcohol, but in the long term, there are changes in the brain that are activated by alcohol and other drug use. We want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to eliminate those risks. There are There's a laundry list of additional things that will happen for youth. For example, when Young people are um, active in sports. Maybe they're training real, you know, that's really important to them. They want to excel in whatever um, athletic pursuits they're involved in. Alcohol has an effect on a young person's training regime. Kids who have worked out real heavily for, you know, a couple of weeks and then go out on a Friday night and become intoxicated can really undo the physiological benefits of that training over the last couple of weeks, just with one night of binge drinking. We want to always make sure that those risks that are um, car you know, present when someone is underage drinking or under the influence of alcohol, things like accidents, um, you know, falling down, tripping, going, you know, the wrong way down a flight of stairs. Also, um, issues of concern around sexual assault when someone is not able to give consent or when someone is not able or unwilling to accept consent or non-consent. Um, even underage um, uh, adolescent or teenage pregnancy has a connection with underage drinking. Um, most of the time, these major risks do not occur and so young people start to say, oh, well, that's, you know, might happen, but it's not going to happen to me. And so we want to do what we can to encourage um, parents to get that message across. You don't know if it's going to happen to you. You don't know what the risks are that you might be exposed to the next time you drink, even if they hadn't ever occurred in the past. Um, and that's where this project really brings um, parents into the mix. We recognize that parents are the most critical piece of the prevention work that happens in a young person's life. Um, and we want to make sure that parents have the information and are empowered to give a real um, solid message. Like these are our family rules and these are the expectations, but also to give 
young people an opportunity to talk about and think about some of the risks that might occur um, and how nobody wants to see their children at risk for um, for any of the really dangerous consequences of alcohol use. So what does becoming a safe home entail? Thank you. Safe Homes is specifically a workshop for parents. It's about 90 minutes long. We've tried to shorten it um, to fit people's busy schedule, but that comes with the risk of leaving out some very critical components. So at the moment, it's a 90 minute parent workshop. Uh, it is provided by a parent educator, um, usually in a team. And it addresses four of the major components of creating a safe home. Um, the first of those components is to ensure that the alcohol in your home is secure so that young hands can't get into it. Um, sometimes when we talk about securing alcohol in the home, people have the misinterpretation that we're talking about, like padlock your refrigerator. Um, that is not what we're talking about. It's like, think about what you have in the home where is it? How is it stored? And have you provided a really solid message to your kids that it's not for them? Um, there are devices that are sold. You can get them on Amazon. This happens to be one um, that you can lock a refrigerator with. More likely, it would be for a, um, a garage or basement refrigerator, something that's not in the middle of a kitchen. It, this one operates on, with a combination lock. It just sticks to the refrigerator. Um, and so there's another one that operates, it's the same thing, but it operates with a key. Again, it just sticks to the refrigerator. The thing about it is, of course, if kid was determined to get in to the refrigerator, they could rip it off. It's not, you know, screwed in, but you would know the parent would know there would be an indication that it had been tampered with. Um, they also on um, Amazon or wherever you buy your gadgets, they have bottle locks. This fits conveniently over the top of a wine bottle or a, a other liquor bottles. You snap it closed. You, oh, well, you set the um, combination and you snap it closed and it's, you're not able to remove it without knowing the combination. There are additionally um, stickers. There are tamper um, resistant stickers. You can put over a bottle cap. If it's opened, you know, because the seal, the, the sticker seal has been broken. Um, it's not going to stop someone from opening a bottle, but it will be evident that it's been opened. So all of that is to say, secure your alcohol, um, put it, in a place where if you have a locked closet or locked cabinet, that's great. Um, know what's in there, know how much. Um, if you're stocking up for a party in particular, so there's a lot of alcohol perhaps at the home, make sure that you know what you've got. The second component of the, um, the workshop is a discussion with parents about talking to their children about alcohol. Um, this is not the, you know, we don't advocate for the talk. There's not one time only. It's not sit your kid down and tell them all the rules of, you know, of drinking or um, of substance use or anything like that. It is that continuous conversation. It's having um, your family values as part of that conversation, your concern for your kid's safety and the safety of their friends. It's asking questions. If you know your kid is um, perhaps experimenting with alcohol or they have, um, you know that they've used alcohol in the past, have a sensitive conversation about that. Not simply the consequences, but you know what made you think you wanted to do that? Why was that something you chose to do at that time? And really seek to understand your kids why. Not all kids drink. So when they do drink, there's there's a reason. And to sort of dig a little deeper and know, maybe the reason has to do with um, a sense of not fitting in or not feeling comfortable in a social situation or, um, you know, they, they felt pressure 
from a friend. Um, the truth of the matter is most of the time that pressure is internal and it's not coming from someone trying to force alcohol into your hand. It's that conversation. Yes, kids will be encouraged by their friends and you know peers, but more likely than not, it's the pressure that comes on the inside of a kid saying, you know, maybe I'll feel more like part of the crowd if I do this, or um, I'm hurting, I'm anxious, I'm feeling badly about myself. Maybe this will um, will ease that bad feeling a little bit. So having those conversations, multiple conversations, and finding ways to find a teachable moment. You see something in a movie or on the television, or you hear something in a song while you're with your kid and say, hey, I just, did you hear that? What do you think about that? Um, or we hear about um, something in the community that happens, a, a, a crash that occurs as a result of drunk driving, or you know, what some sort of outside um, information comes your way. Share that with your child and ask what their thoughts are. Use that as that teachable moment. Use that as that moment to say, I hope that if you're ever in a situation, you'll feel comfortable to come to me. I'm gonna to wanna to try to come to you. Um, and, and just keep that conversation flowing. Third component is never serving alcohol to youth in your home. It is not against the law to serve alcohol to your own child in your own home, but it is always against Rhode Island law to serve alcohol to someone else's underage child. It, that is the social host law. We should take it very seriously. It doesn't matter if you provide the alcohol, in your home, as long as you have given space or the environment for a young person to use alcohol, whether you gave it to them or not, you could be held liable for the social for social host. That goes for parties as well. And part of the um, like adult party, mixed age group parties, one of the um, important aspects of that of the workshop is that we have parents discuss that with each other and think about. Um, scenarios that might occur. It might be a kid coming over to spend the night at your house and they've brought a bottle of, of alcohol with them. Or it could be a multi-age party and you need to figure out how to keep, you know, the blue cooler is the cooler with, with um, soft drinks and the red cooler is the cooler with alcohol and those two coolers are nowhere near each other so if you see a kid headed over or a young person headed over to the alcohol cooler you can simply say oh you know what the soft drinks are in the blue cooler and it's not a federal issue it's just hey you don't have anything in this cooler for you how about let's find you something you can drink um and so part of the workshop is to have the parents um talk about those issues um with each other. And then the final piece is probably the most challenging piece of all. And that is encouraging parents to talk to the parents of their children's friends. Um, very hard, very intimidating to pick up the phone, especially if you don't know the parent at all and say, Hey, um, you know, Greg, my son is coming over to your house. Do you, are you going to be there? Well, here's the thing. My husband and I are concerned about underage drinking. We've heard a lot of stories lately about kids doing it, and we want to make sure that there's no access to alcohol while my son's at your house. Super hard. I say that sentence, all, that little sentence all the time, and it's still really hard. Um, my, my personal story is that my kids, we lived in one community and my children went to school, high school in a separate community where I knew none of their parents. That's a really hard thing to ask because you do feel like you're at risk of either alienating someone or offending them in some way. But the fact of the matter is most parents want to ask those questions. Most parents want to have that conversation. Um, and if there's a parent that really is resistant um, to having the conversation, one thing is you it might make you consider whether your child's going to spend the night there or not, or they just might not be ready to have that conversation. And there's, you know, several ways of broaching the topic simply by saying, this is a really hard thing for me to ask, but I'm really concerned about my kid and his, and his behavior and then spitting it out. Um, chances are the other parent is going to be grateful that you asked.
So those are the four components and the um, and there's practice during the workshop for each parent um, to to practice those um, four steps with each other. So I'm assuming this is I'm going to use the word safe space um, just because um, parents have all sorts of different views on this. And um, I'm assuming we're encouraging all parents with different views to come and learn because um, I've heard a lot of arguments for letting kids drink at home. And um, I, I'm assuming that we'd like everybody at the table to sort of discuss all those ideas. Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's such an important point, Polly. Everybody does come with their own perspective. Um, we hear lots of challenges to the age 21 and why it's age 21. We hear a lot of um, I, folks thinking that, well, if they're at home, they're safe, we take the keys away. Uh, there's a lot of perspectives out there. And one of the things that Strategic Prevention Partnership does as well as Newport County Prevention Coalition is that we rely on research. We go back and we look at the evidence-based strategies and the impl implications of those strategies. It is not safe to allow your kids to drink at home because the message that that sends is, hey, if it's okay you know, at 101 Main Street, why is it not okay on you know, 42 Elm Street? It's okay at my house. Well, it's okay at my friend's house. And then a little bit later, well, it, you know, it's okay if we're sitting down at the beach or we're in the car. I'm not driving, so it must be okay. So we want to make a really solid, unequivocal, it is not okay in our family for underage youth to drink, period. There is no safe way to teach someone how to drink. That, that just doesn't happen. We know from research that if someone drinks prior to the, especially prior to the age of 17, the likelihood of lifelong alcohol issues rises exponentially. If someone waits until after age 21, the risks of long-term issues with alcohol drops precipitously. It's about brain development. And it is about the introduction of alcohol into the brain while certain parts, certain elements of the brain are developing. The most, the, the, one of the latest steps in brain development is the frontal lobe. That is the part of the brain that really focuses on executive functioning, organization, planning for consequences, all of those sort of higher functioning uh thinking uh, processes, we don't want to do anything to affect those higher level brain functions. At that very critical time, when those pieces are becoming solidified, the introduction of alcohol or any other substance that may have an effect on that brain, we don't want to interfere with that. So that when I say there's no safe underage drinking that's that's why it's the brain. It's not anything special about young people other than brain development. Um, and the fact the kids can't see because their brain's not fully developed, they can't see the potential end point or the potential consequences of their actions. I definitely need the lock for my fridge and my cabinet. <laughs> Wait, get in there, Greg. Yeah, it's, not even, it's not even alcohol. <laughs> it's the snacks. That's what I need it for. Definitely. What are the hopeful steps of a parent after concluding the um, safe homes training? When we ask that parents take that message. We ask them to take a pledge. Um, it's the safe homes promise. Um, says that I will provide a secure storage place for alcohol in my home. I will communicate the risks of alcohol use with my children. I will not allow the possession or use of alcohol by youth in my home or my property. I will communicate with other parents about my family's expectations of no alcohol use from my children. So we ask that parents take this home. There's a place to sign 
because evidence says that that makes a difference. If somebody puts their signature on something, they will take it that much more seriously. We don't ask to collect these cards. They're not making the promise to me or to us. They're making the promise to themselves. The one thing we do ask is that they put this safe home promise someplace where they'll see it often. We follow up in six months with a phone call, um, as long as the parents agree to that while they're at the workshop. We just call and we ask, how's it going? And we ask a question about each of the four pieces of the, of the promise and say, hey, did you do anything differently when you got home to store your alcohol? Hey, have you had a conversation with your kids? We're not being any more intrusive than have you done it or have you not done it? And then the fifth question is, have you hung up the safe homes promise in a place where you see it often? Those are the five follow-up pieces. The hope is that there's a yes to all of those. We absolutely recognize that, the, you know, it would really depend on the age of your child when you participate. You know, if somehow we were able to get a, a kindergartner's parent in here, they may only have a yes to one of those questions. Um, you know, that we all should be locking up um, you know, just like we lock up the poisons that are underneath our our kitchen sink when kids are little, we also need to be making sure they're not getting alcohol um, even at the point in their lives when they don't even know what the alcohol is for. Uh, so there's a safety aspect. And why not start locking up your alcohol as soon as you're baby proofing your house? Um, kids grow fast, as we know. Um, we want the culture in our communities to be one that says, we do really care about our kids, all of our kids, not just our own in our home, but all kids. And we want to make sure that the community is as safe as possible. So if by me sticking my neck out a little bit and having these conversations with other parents kind of helps to start a ripple effect, then I'll I'll stick my neck out a little um, and see if I can't make a difference among my, my adult peers. Um, so basically that is, that's the safe homes promise. Um, it, it, the Safe Homes Workshop leads to those four components, which leads to taking the promise and the hope that parents bring that home to their own families. Um, and then finally, if parents are so interested and engaged, um, we would love to see participation in our um, five community municipal coalitions. Um, there's one in each of the towns, Newport County. Um, we're really in particular looking for um, participation by parents. It's not requirement and it, I'm just putting out a plug um, for participation in the prevention coalitions. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of um, fun and interesting ways that we're reaching out to families and communities. And we're just really always looking for ways to engage parent partners in those experiences. If um someone or some organization is interested in participating in the Safe Homes Workshop, um, how should they reach you? They should reach me at director at riprevention.org. I will go anywhere or have um, one of our trained staff go anywhere to do a presentation on Safe Homes. Um, I in my mind, think about um, the Safe Homes Workshop in like a Tupperware party or a Pampered Chef party. We'll go, we'll go to your house, invite your friends, have a snack, um, and we'll share this. And nobody has to pay anything. Nobody has to buy one more gadget for their kitchen drawers. Um, it's that same sort of thing. It doesn't have to be a formal setting. It doesn't have to be 25 people. It doesn't have to be in a... Uh, you know, a school or a public building will we'll virtually go anywhere to share the message around safe homes. Um, we haven't perfected a virtual safe homes workshop, um, but I suppose it might be possible. The downside of that is it's more challenging for um, participants to kind of talk with each other and, and brainstorm and share ideas. Um, not impossible, just a, a little less um, friendly or, or social. Uh, we'd rather do it in person so that whoever is in attendance is able to um, feel like they can share their points of view. 
um, and you know, Polly used the, expen the, the uh, expression safe space. It is a safe space. There's no judgment um, intended. I am not the perfect parent. Um, my children have grown to adulthood now, so perhaps I did something right or else I got lucky, um, but no judgment. Um, these are things I wish that when I had young teens, I wish someone had said to me, hey, why don't you consider this? Or, hey, have you thought about that? Uh, like I mentioned, the the challenge of sending kids to high school in a different community. Um, some of the things that I know now that were mistakes that I made back then, um, I would love to have had a parent who'd been through it uh, kind of, you know, plant a seed for me. Um, that would have made my children safer. Um, it would have made me feel safer in the long run. Um, but there's no um, no judgment. And I think sometimes people, uh, parents in particular, back away from um, totally preventable experiences because of that fear of judgment. Or if I, here's one that's really important. If I attend a substance prevention related workshop, are people going to take note that maybe there's a problem in my household? Um, the answer is no, because there's something to be learned by everyone, regardless of um, how things are going in your household. Um, and quite honestly, if we were more aware that every family is feeling some sort of challenge or another, it would make things a lot more comfortable for us. Um, it's, you know, it's the planet fitness, no you know, judgment-free zone kind of motto, um, totally judgment-free. Can only parents pledge on to the um, safe homes? Is this something that uh, businesses or organizations can partner up with? I think it would be great. Um, one group of folks that we would really love to um, connect with and engage are our grand families, our grandparents or kinship um, folks who are raising um, children in their in their homes, um, you know, grandparents uh, would be a fab. Whether they're raising the children or just sometimes supervising the children, um, it'd be great to have grandparents come in there because it's reinforcement of the message that we would want to get across. Um, and sometimes what grandparents or aunts and uncles, uh, godparents or cousins. Sometimes what they say has a different impact than what a parent is saying. So that group, yes, in particular, we would love to get um, some of those family relations. Um, businesses would be awesome because oftentimes in a business, you might have, you know, three or four, or six or eight different people, all raising kids of different ages. Um, and it would be lovely to be able to bring that conversation to that group and have them have the opportunity to talk with each other outside of the workshop and reinforce what they've learned and, you know, talk about how it's going in their own homes. Because one of the most lonely times um, for a parent, I believe, is when they think that something might be going on in their child's life. They can't really put their finger on it. And they really don't have anybody who they feel comfortable having that conversation with. Um, you know, it's not one of those uh, party conversations you just pull out and, you know, talk with your, you know, necessarily with your friends about. It would be great to have people who are either like-minded or if not like-minded, at least having had the same sort of frame of reference. Um, so any group of folks, whether it be a nonprofit organization that people might participate in, uh, a, biz a local business would be great. And again, we will go to you. If you have a comfortable spot to sit, you happily come and sit and have this conversation with people. This seems like a good opportunity for PTOs and other parent groups. I, I think PTOs would be a really great opportunity because they tend to be the folks that are kind of looking out for other parents and looking out for their community members. Um, and it's, you know, kind of, again, I'll use the example of that ripple effect. You know, if 10 people at a PTO meeting hear the message and they can share out the pieces, it, this is not complicated stuff. I mean, parts of it, like the conversations with other parents, yeah, that becomes a little bit more challenging, um, just, just comfort level. But to re be able to repeat four 
components um, and tell, you know, hey, this is how we would do this, or this is why we should do that. Anybody can share this information with each other. Um, and that's sort of how that message starts to spread across um, a community or a town or, you know, the county. Um, nothing would be better than for other people to grab the message and start sharing it. Um, we can't necessarily get to everybody. Everybody's not going to hear the message directly from strategic prevention partnerships. But if we start having this conversation out and about in our communities, through our schools, through our PTOs, through businesses, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to think that even physicians who are, um, you know, seeing parents when their kids are going in for um, well child visits or uh, annual physicals, physicians could be sharing some of this information. Um, coaches. Man, I, I don't think there's enough to be said about the influence that coaches have on the lives of young people and their families. If coaches um, want to get together and hear this message, um, it won't be specific to necessarily their own home, but specific to um, the kids that they coach. We would love to do that. Well, thanks for all this information. Um, I hope um, we get some people that reach out to you at director at riprevention.org. Boom. Thanks. <laughs> you got it. It's not often Greg gives me a boom. <laughs> and it. <no. laughs> um, yeah. You my I'm sorry. <laughs> director at riprevention.org. Yes. Um, and thank you for sharing this information with us always helpful and useful and enlightening. Are there any upcoming trainings? Or no, we don't have any. We do not have one scheduled at the moment. Um, we're just waiting for that next request and we'll get it scheduled. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.